right on target with what prophecy says, this month of October is indeed turning out to be quite a black October. The day after 57 Kenyans were killed in a horror road accident, yeah, close to Mohoroni, yeah, that was on October 10th, the next day, a billionaire businessman called Mohammed Deji, yeah, was kidnapped in Dar es Salaam. At 43 years old, Mohammed Deji is widely recognized as the youngest billionaire on the continent. He has even featured in the very authoritative Forbes magazine. Now, billionaires all over the world normally have security around them. Yeah. However, not in Tanzania. And if you understand the country called Tanzania, you'll understand why no security is required. And I'll come to that in a minute. And so, Mo Deuji, as he's popularly known, drove himself to a gym at about 5 a.m. in the morning for his usual workout. Moments before he arrived at the Coliseum Hotel and Fitness Club, which is where his gym was, two cars arrived at the parking lot of the gym. Yeah? And they parked and waited. Mo Deuji arrived, alighted from his vehicle, and then one of the cars that had come earlier flashed its headlights. Now obviously this was a signal because what happened next is that two hooded men emerged from one of the two vehicles and grabbed the billionaire. And while they were doing so, they fired shots into the air. That of course reduced the number of eyewitnesses yeah, because people scampered for safety. Now hearing the sound of gunfire is very, very rare in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. It is much more likely for somebody to hear gunfire in Nairobi, Kenya, several times during their lifetimes. In Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, it is much more likely that a man could be born and live to the age of 70 and die without hearing a single gunshot in his entire lifetime. And the car carrying the kidnapped billionaire, speeded off and vanished into thin air. Now I believe we all know that what happens shortly before a crime and shortly after that crime usually gives you very useful tips yeah, as to who is behind that particular crime. Now what happened after this uh, particular kidnapping is extremely instructive in my view. Within moments of the kidnapping, senior police officers were issuing a statement to the press that the people involved in that kidnapping were foreigners, white men. And they were saying all this in a very conclusive manner because they had a rider to that. They were saying foreigners are coming to wreck the peace in our country and we will not allow it. Now in my view, my very informed view, because I've lived in Tanzania, I'm very familiar with the Oyster Bay area, yeah, where this crime happened, etc, etc. In my view, that was a political statement. So now the big puzzle is how come, how can it happen that immediately after such a serious crime as the kidnapping of a billionaire, police who are experienced in investigating yeah, and understand one of the first rules of investigations is that you do not release information that you have so quickly because it could assist the perpetrators to escape, to elude you, yeah, because you're giving away too much information that you already have. Still, in those circumstances, police release very specific information connected to the crime. How did that happen? Why did it happen? Now, assuming that those kidnappers were indeed white men, that one I doubt, and I'll tell you why in a minute, but assuming they were white men, you have already given them information that will greatly assist them in escaping. Yeah, because they already know, you know that it was white men, despite the fact that they were hooded. They already know you're looking for white men, and therefore they'll be able to come up with plans, and indeed the right strategy, to avoid detection or even arrest. 
Now, why was a billionaire the richest man in Tanzania and the second largest employer after the government? <laughs> why was such a man traveling without security? Now, the security system in Tanzania has to be admired. Yeah. The foundation of this security system is Nyumbakumi. Yeah, Nyumbakumi is where every 10 households have a leader. This leader is like a chief in Kenya. Yeah, they report directly to the authorities on what has been happening in that particular neighborhood yeah, of those 10 houses very regularly. And so, for instance, if a foreigner comes in, they will report directly and they will give details. Such and such uh, foreigners came in, they live in a big house alone, they're in the house the whole day, so they don't seem to have a job and there's no business they seem to be doing, etc., etc. So this information can quickly be checked out yeah, by the authorities. And this Nyumba Kumi strategy, security strategy, strandles the entire country of Tanzania. Now, to commit a crime, yeah, you will first of all have to set up base. But how do you set up base undetected in Tanzania? Impossible. And over the years, many criminal gangs and even terrorist groups have tried to infiltrate Tanzania and they've been defeated. Yeah. The Al-Shabaab group has tried several times yeah, trying to use the camouflage of the country's sizable Muslim population, but they have failed. Many Kenyan criminals, attracted by the huge sums of uh, donor funds flooding the country in the late 90s and early 2000s, have tried and also failed miserably. Secondly, the Oyster Bay area in Tanzania is what I can call a security zone. Very many embassies and high commissions are situated in this area. Even the Kenyan High Commission is in this particular area. What that means is that there are CCTV cameras all over the place, in almost every gate. What that means is that assuming somebody made a call even five minutes after the incident, yeah, whoever these kidnappers were should have been cornered, arrested, before they got very far. Okay, granted, admittedly. 5 a.m. is very early in the morning, and generally uh, Dar es Salaam wakes up late. Many shops you'll find open after 10. These people are not early risers, at least not early risers like Nairobians here in Nairobi, Kenya. However, it is also true that security never goes to sleep, and therefore the information I've given you about how secure this area is still holds water despite the fact that it was still very early in the morning. Now, given this information, a possible white kidnapper, you know, two white men, who is uh, intelligent, not even very intelligent, just reasonably intelligent, would not have kidnapped the billionaire at his gym. For real kidnappers, it would have been much more prudent to do this thing quietly and escape quietly. Undetected. Now, Mr. Deji's house is about two kilometers away from the scene of the crime where he was kidnapped. And I've already told you I know this area very well. And I can therefore assure you that there are many places away from CCTV cameras, away from well guarded embassy or high commission grounds, where they would have simply blocked his car, we laid him, and quietly kidnapped him with the, no witnesses at all. Instead, it was done movie style, with an emphasis on the two white men, two white men who were hooded, who kidnapped the billionaire. Now, before we go any further, let us look at other recent kidnappings that have happened in Tanzania. And let us also pay special attention to who has been involved in those kidnappings. In 2012, the chairman of the Tanzanian Medical Association then, Abwana Stephen Olimboka was kidnapped and he was kidnapped while having a meeting with a state house official. He was then beaten up, yeah, his uh, fingernails plucked out, some of his teeth 
front teeth plucked out, beaten up generally very thoroughly, and tortured. Yeah, and then he was abandoned at a forest, a forest called Mwange Pande in Dar es Salaam. Now, instructively, this particular doctor was chairman of a committee striking, yeah, a committee of doctors on strike. In other words, he was the main brains, he was the main force behind the doctor strike in Tanzania at that time. As the doctor was recovering, yeah, because he was rescued and uh, rushed to hospital, as he was recovering, he made it very clear that these unknown kidnappers were government agents. Yeah, it was the government which kidnapped him. And even later, in talks in the UK, in lectures he held in the UK, he very clearly told the world that it was the government that was behind his uh, torture and kidnap. Now, that was during the reign of former Tanzanian president, Jakaya Mrisho Kikwete. Actually, these strange kidnappings happened or started happening in Tanzania for the first time shortly after the controversial re-election of uh, President Kikwete in 2010. Indeed, the very first disputed presidential election in Tanzania. But these kidnappings went overboard when the current president, John Pombe Magufuli, took over. The reign of this draconian dictator has been marred by numerous kidnappings and human rights violations. There was the kidnapping of the Mwananchi newspaper journalist, Azori Gwanda, who has never been traced to date. There was the kidnapping of the former head of research and policy within the Chandema opposition party, Bwana Ben Sanane, who has never been traced to date. Then on April 5, 2017, there was the kidnapping of a musician and his three friends yeah, from a studio in the Masaki area. Masaki is not very far from where the billionaire was kidnapped. The musician's name was Ibrahim Musa, a.k.a. Roma Mkatoliki. Now those are just a few of the kidnappings that have gone down, that I've mentioned. All those kidnappings, all without fail, were linked to the government of Tanzania. All kidnappings were linked to people who had opposed the government. People who had annoyed the government. And especially people who had dared to contradict yeah, John Pombe Magfuli, the president of Tanzania. Fascinatingly, this Tanzanian president is especially sensitive to people who want to dig into his educational background. Now, Magfuli is called Dr. John Pombe Magfuli, yeah, implying a PhD somewhere. And one would expect a PhD holder, somebody who has been educated up to that level, to be much more tolerant of other views, yeah, views which are different from his own. But Bwana Magfuli is different. <laughs> you just try and dig into his educational background. <laughs> Jaribu utaona chemta makuni. Jaribu utajua ambayo ujui. Or rather, utajua ujui. Now, human nature is such that you cannot be sensitive about something for nothing. There's usually a good reason. And so, we can be sure that there must be something yeah, about the president's uh, educational background <laughs> that is extremely wary, sensitive, and scared about. And so, with this information, it is safe to conclude that it is highly unlikely, highly unlikely, that the latest kidnapping of billionaire Mo Deuji yeah, was actually done by a, an outfit that is not linked to the government. Highly unlikely. It is highly unlikely that now there's a new gang of kidnappers other than the gang of kidnappers that have been carrying out all the other kidnappings. It's highly unlikely. Now, why would the government be upset at more doji? Let's maybe try and answer that question. Now, of course, more doji is a very powerful man within Tanzania because, as we have said, is the second largest employer after the government. There's no other organization in Tanzania that employs more people than Bonadeuji. And so, 
it is rather obvious that the current government of John Pombe Magufuli must always be very wary of this man, even if he's on their side all the time. I mean, he has been CCM throughout. He was even a legislator, an MP for the Singida area, for 10 years, yeah, from 2005 to 2015. So apart from the business world, this man is also a political insider. <laughs> Definitely a very dangerous man. Now, we also know that the business community in Tanzania in recent times, yeah, has uh, become very uncomfortable with the economic policies of John Pombe Magfuli. For starters, foreign investors have been leaving the country in large numbers. And those who are still in the country have dramatically cut down on their investments and they have abandoned and cancelled future expansion plans or put them on hold. Now, President Magufuli has championed a lot of things that would discourage and chase away foreign investors. For instance, there's no foreign educational system surviving in Tanzania anymore. So what that means, if you're an expatriate and you come into the country with your family and you have children of school going age, they can't go to school in Tanzania. But that is a small issue. Yeah, many investors who are eager enough to invest in Tanzania will ignore that one. So here's a bigger one, and this is a very recent example. The Vodacom company in Tanzania was very keen yeah, to beat off uh, the rising competition that it has experienced in recent years, which I've seen the previous confident by far market leader being reduced to a very shaky market leader rapidly losing market share and rapidly losing the ground they had gained in Tanzania before. So they went to a sister company, Safaricom of Kenya, yeah, looking for a CEO. And they were given a very effective leader in Sylvia Mulinge, whom they promptly appointed. However, Sylvia Mulinge was denied a work permit by the Tanzanian government. Now hold on a minute. Tanzania is part of the East African community. One would expect that the work permit for somebody coming from one of the East African community member countries would be a mere formality. But Ms. Mulinge was bluntly denied a work permit. This is the first time in the history of East Africa that somebody from the community or somebody from the region has been denied a work permit. Now this is just one example. And you know, as a foreign investor, you're keen to grow your company or your business within the country with uh, minimal frustrations, least of all from the government directly, like in this case. And that's not all. Miners, huge mining companies in Tanzania, have been forced to renegotiate contracts. That in itself set a very dangerous president and a very scary one for any foreign investor. As a foreign investor, you don't want to go into a country negotiate a contract, knowing at the back of your mind that that contract can be null and void at any time, and that you can be forced by the government to renegotiate it at any time. You don't want that. Because business is a challenge enough, you don't want unpredictability in your contracts. That's the last thing you want. The long and short of all this is that the Tanzanian economy has been brought to its knees. With rapidly reducing foreign injection of capital, most economists are predicting that it's only a matter of time before the Tanzanian economy grounds to a halt. Now, in this kind of environment, it's not difficult to imagine the other business leaders and the other CEOs and leaders of various uh, multinationals approaching Mr. Mo Deuji yeah, because of his contacts with the government the fact that is not only a member of the ruling CCM party, but has been a legislator for the same party for over 10, for 10 years, yeah, from 2005 to 2015. All this makes him the perfect candidate to speak on behalf of business to State House, yeah, to Bona Magfuli, to Doctor, if you can call him that, Dr. Pombe Magfuli. Now, it's widely known that uh, President Magfuli does not accommodate views that are different from his. He once famously said, Mimi Sijibiwi, 
loose translation, you don't answer back to me. That's like in the situation where you're a parent, when you tell your child something, they're not supposed to answer back. They're just supposed to obey. Now we also know but that, that Bonadeuji is very open-minded. And <laughs> taking this into consideration, that is definitely a collision cause. Yeah, something was bound to go wrong, if it has not already gone wrong. Very interesting, if we check uh, the last few tweets of Bona Mo Doji, <laughs> they're very different from any other tweets you'll see in his account. He's, he's complaining. He's complaining about people who don't impact on your growth, who must be ignored. In my view, the fact that uh, we've been told very quickly that those responsible were two white men seems to have two objectives. One, because all the previous kidnappings have been uh, government-sponsored, the idea here was to take the mind of uh, most people, most keen observers of the Tanzanian government, and even the people of Tanzania, to take their minds completely away from the possibility that the government was involved in the kidnapping of, uh, of Bonomo Doji. Secondly, it is the kind of thing that would give the government, the regime, political support from the masses to deal with foreigners. Because the government has been under fire recently, especially in parliament, for its economic policies, which seem hinged on harassing foreign investors. So the fact that we are told there were two white men involved would be a message to the public, yeah, so that the public would support the government and understand that the government is dealing with evil foreign investors or evil foreigners masquerading as investors. And armed with this kind of political support from the masses, the regime can continue on the same path that it has started on. Of course, the big question and the big puzzle here is what the end game is. Because any educated man will want to think through every action, every step they take, so that they know what end game they are after, and so that they can be able to gauge accurately whether the end game is sustainable, let alone realistic. Because after you, you hound all the foreign investors out of the country and foreign investments, what next for the Tanzanian economy? Now, to make matters even worse, yeah, concerning this uh, very unfortunate kidnapping of Mo Doji, is the fact that 30 people have been arrested so far. 30! The whole idea here seems to be to hoodwink the public that the government is working very hard to trace and find and arrest the foreign kidnappers of Mohammed Deuji. Now, if you look at the list of people arrested, most of them are just eyewitnesses. Three employees at the gym, five security guards belonging to the G1 security company, which is the company in charge of security at the hotel, the hotel security manager, and so on and so forth. In other words, it may seem that the whole idea is to ensure that in case any of the eyewitnesses saw something they're not supposed to see, something which is inconsistent with the rhetoric that the government of Tanzania wants to sell to the world, then these people will be shut up uh, in advance. They will not be able to tell anybody what they saw. Our prayers go to the Mo Deuji family, and it is our hope that he will be found as soon as possible. Until next time, this is Chris Kumekucha.